Hi, this is Uncle Matt's D&D Studio. I'm Matt Finch. First thing out of the box, Allah, don't watch this. Uh, Jim, don't watch this. Shane, don't watch this. Uh, Zach, I guess Zach, you can go ahead and watch it if you want to. But all of the players who are going to be in the online campaign, uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of things here that you're not allowed to see. Uh, so turn off the video now if you haven't already. All right. Now, um, first off, everybody who's listening, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do that. And what we're going to be doing here, and the reason why uh, the players in the online game, which is about to start soon, are not allowed to watch it, is because the what we're doing here is we're going to brainstorm uh, the beginning of the campaign and the first adventure in real time. I do take a couple of breaks. I've already recorded the videos. Uh, a couple of breaks, five minutes at a time, go out in the backyard, play with Milo, basically, and let things uh, you know sit and percolate as I'm doing it. Um, but what this does is it gives you... Um, sort of a condensed uh, version of um, what the procedures are. Obviously, I, you know, the way that I do this isn't the way that um, uh, anyone else necessarily does, and I've probably done this, you know, different ways in the past. But uh, we're going to uh, see the actual process and thought process, and I'm going to talk aloud, and in the first one I'm actually making notes, so you'll be able to see how that works. And we are looking at a blank sheet of lined paper here on the screen today. And the reason is that since I'm going to be running an online game um, starting in uh, two days, actually, um, we're going to start with the brainstorming for the campaign and the dungeon. Um, there are a few things I already know about it just because I've been talking to the, the players and I had some ideas when I was in Spain. Um, first of all is that it's going to be called Swords of Jordaba. And the reason for that is that Jordaba, which is, you know, rhymes with Cordoba in Spain, um, uh, is going to be the main city. Um, and, uh, and then there are the swords. So Swords of Jordaba, that's going to be the, the name of the campaign. And uh, we also know that it's going to have a sort of Moorish, Moroccan um, feel to the area, um, obviously with, with Islam removed and replaced with the polytheism that um, uh, you always find in D&D campaigns, because that's going to work well. Um, I do know that we're going to have um, all of the major races uh, that exist in D&D, &D because we've already had uh, one human selected, one dwarf, one elf, and one halfling. So we're going to have the whole spread of that there. Now, um, what we're going to talk about in this video is basically the design of the mega dungeon uh, that is going to be out there. Uh, it's going to be uh, more of a an option for them to keep going into this mega dungeon. It's not going to be something that I'm going to push on them, um, except for probably in the first uh, adventure, because you always need to have something going in the first adventure to give the players a little bit of direction, and then when they start learning more about the world and so on and so forth, then uh, they'll go and do their own thing in that. So, um, when designing a mega dungeon, one of the the key features, I think, about the way that they're structured uh, is that they're made up basically of small, or should be made up, of small areas of rooms. And, and this box represents not a single room. It might, uh, you know, have a, a couple of different rooms in it, you know, three or four usually. And um, then there's going to be a, we're, we're thinking sort of in terms of a flow chart here, there's going to be um, connections to other areas. And they might be right next door. There, there might actually be no spatial difference here. Um, this second area here, um, it's showing, you know, this once again like a flowchart. This is a schematic. It's not necessarily a distance diagram. So um, this one here is going to be our entrance. And that's because you need to have an entrance in every dungeon or things don't go very far. And then uh, this area over here, I decided that um, the first thing that they're going to do is probably going to be in some way focused on a temple because I want to give them a mission. And so basically the, the mission is going to tell them something very simple. It's going to be go in, you know, and then head toward your right when you go in. So this little area of rooms here is going to be a temple. And that's going to be our first mission objective. And I don't really know yet what it is that's going to, going to be there, but uh, probably something's gone wrong for the clerics in the temple because I, I do that an awful lot. Clearly I've got you know some sort of childhood thing about things going wrong for clerics. This over here, uh, and this is something that 
I often do in dungeons is that you generally the entrance to the dungeon has been some at some point a very well traveled place with lots of supplies and things coming in. So this area here is going to be the stable complex. Um, and I don't they you know they could get into this area um, if they take a wrong turn or something like that. So I'm going to plan for each of the various uh, little subsections of the dungeon that are around here. And so um, when we're talking, for example, about um, you know this temple complex, this right here is just going to be a big gate. And so once again, even though we're seeing a line here, what we're actually going to be seeing from their perspective is, a, is, is this gate, and then it's going to head directly into the series of temple rooms. Um, not sure how many rooms there, there will be in the entrance. That might be, uh, you know, just one main antechamber, maybe a couple of side chambers from it. It's going to be pretty small, um, although the room itself, you know, probably want to have be, you know, big and impressive. Uh, the, the temple, the way that I like to do temples is um, long ago, and I think it was when I was reading The Tombs of Atuan um, by uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, was the idea of an outer temple and an inner temple. So we're going to have, the, the outer temple is just going to be an area where regular old people went for sort of worship stuff. And then we're going to have an inner temple. And then there's going to be, uh, you know, basically rooms um, for the priests. And, you know, whatever it is that, that they need uh, here. Um, probably not going to do a, a kitchen or worry about anything like that right at the moment. The main thing that the that this is going to lead to here, though, uh, th these this will be where the mission takes place probably. Um, but the other thing that we're going to put in this area is the stairs down. And the reason being that when you're doing a mega dungeon, you want your characters to have a fair amount of mobility to go ahead and do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, generally, adventurers in a mega dungeon will not stay very long on the first level. They're going to go down to the second level and push their luck just a little bit. The um, So I want them to be able to, to identify fairly quickly where it is that the stairs are so that they know that in the future and if they want to go down to the second level on their next adventure or even you know if, if this one finishes up fast in terms of the mission uh, make it possible for them to get to those stairs easily rather than having the sort of thing that you often see in a video game where um, finding the stairs is a major major sort of undertaking and if you and, and, and while that's kind of fun in a, in a video game uh, when you're doing repeated game sessions that's not really so great. So uh, you know, again, to to give them that sort of mobility in the dungeon, uh, we've still got this area in here, and I think um, what we have not got down here is is the kitchen. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to make this sort of a great hall area. And so really, what we're designing here is a is a castle more than anything else, but. Uh, uh, you know, that's fine, because as they go on and get out of this area, we'll start having some things that are uh, different from it. So here we'll have our, our great hall, uh, we'll have our kitchen, uh, we'll have uh, probably a couple storerooms. And then with, with these four initial areas, then we will have basically outlined um, the, 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 the normal expected residential stuff, and we can start getting to more interesting areas. Now, there is going to be probably a connection between the stables and the great hall area because if the storerooms are in here then the stables are going to be you're going to be unloading food and stuff like that and once again this is not spatially um, correct or to scale or anything like that this again is probably going to be a big gate uh, or door or arch or something like that. So that's how I'm going to organize things. And like, you know, the, the entrance, as I was saying, the entrance might just be something like, uh, you know, this will have a, you know, the, the way that you get in through the big uh, gates. We'll have our big gate to our temple area over here. 
um, we'll have a, maybe a smaller or less impressive at least gate leading over here to the stables and then we will have a, uh, a door here that's probably more of a normal size that's leading up to the uh, the great hall area um, and then the connections between the stuff will get us you know in some way like this only once again the you know the connection will be uh, a large gate and then this will be uh, at least currently I think that'll this area will be isolated off by itself except that we do know it's going to have stairs down so those are going to be somewhere in here so that's what we've got for the basic structure of the mega dungeon that we're going to be putting together at least at the outset and it's I think very important with a mega dungeon uh, not to over plan uh, in terms of these areas you don't you want to leave yourself room uh, to think of something else that's got to go in there and so that's I'm really going to just leave it with these four and then this will you know probably expand considerably later now since I'm um, going to be using terrain or, or minis at least that's what the plan is going to be and I am uh, I've got a bunch of bones minis but also I'd kind of like to have some unusual monsters maybe some stuff that I you know make or craft myself I have some uh, you know quick drying air drying clay and so uh, one of the things I'm thinking of in terms of monsters and you know here we're, we're brainstorming um, the various things that I could make myself are of course oozes and slimes and all of stuff like this which is very very easy to make with clay you were probably able to do it in kindergarten I know I was and then um, let's see if I could find a snail shell or something I might be able to do that I don't know where there's a snail shell um, but uh, oh so a slug you know, we can have slugs of some kind I can make slugs um, land octopus once again sort of thing that uh, you could do back when you're in kindergarten so a land octopus maybe it's got a shell I could probably put a shell on a land octopus without actually needing a snail shell um, so that actually might be easier than a snail specifically um, what other kind of stuff um, so it's an, uh, animal headed oozy thing um, I do that with the miniatures by um, using an exacto knife to cut the uh, the head off some bones monster if I can find something that would go well on an oozy thing maybe the oozy thing has tentacles well, my octopus would also have tentacles if I do that but so we'll put a question mark by that it's, that's a little more of a stretch there um, uh, I could I could make snakes or worms or something like that or maybe, maybe maybe some kind of big worm segmented or something like that like a real skinny small purple worm um, all right so there's there's some uh, some good ideas I'm thinking also you know you can make a, a cylinder kind of a thing but I can't make a really good cylinder so we'll sort of leave that for the time being um, so anyway so here are some monsters and then we've got um, in terms of the mission I don't know and then um, in addition to the mission we have the sort of backstory and this is going to be whatever nastiness it is that happened to the clerics oh so and in, in terms of the general idea of the mega dungeon too um, one of the things when you when you're figuring out what's actually in uh, or rather what's the history of a mega dungeon um, you want to leave that kind of vague but um, since I know that I've got my city uh, Jordaba over here um, this why don't we um, we'll make it the old city so that we've got lots of explanation um, it's always got to be ancient because you never know you know what you're gonna want to put in there so leave yourself a big time line where uh, you know some machine might come from uh, a very long time ago or you might have something that's a lot more recent and so the old city got buried somehow and so once again hmm, um, pissed off God we're starting to get a lot of pissed off gods in this story if this is what happens to the temple also um, so pissed off gods and they bury the city and um, 
it's and then they build a the newer city nearby or it's you know uh, less ancient maybe but still very very old because I want to have an old city um, so this one's very very ancient but it's probably still in use and we'll say that the temple was still in use um, so our mission still can have something to do with the temple and something happened in the temple and so the priests there have not um, reported back or something like that um, then let's see and so um, looking for ideas here um, I'm going to take out my copy of Tome of Adventure Design which you know there's Tome of Adventure Design and uh, for me that's not cheating on a brainstorm session because I wrote it and these are my brainstorm notes anyway okay so we took a couple minutes pause there while I got the book open and um, usually one of my go-to tables in here is the mission table on page 15 and the book's been reprinted but I think the pagination is still the same um, and so what that page looks like um, is well, let's put that there kind of missions um, and it's got uh, types of missions um, and actually um, let me just roll up a couple of things on here and see what it is that happens there's my percentile where's my tensider that's tensider okay um, so the type of mission um, is going to be 25 um, that's a mission having to do with individuals let's just switch over here okay so it's a mission we rolled up one having to do with individuals and um, the other options were uh, items, uh, locations, and events. Um, so individual based missions, uh, we rolled an 84 which is sabotage efforts of. And then second one is who it's who's the subject of it and that's 39 39 is going to be a messenger. So sabotage the efforts of a messenger. Now we're going into a mega dungeon so the messenger is already going to have to be there or else they're preventing him from leaving. Um, let's take a another thing and, and roll on table uh, 1 8 for patrons and targets because I think I want something a little bit more or a little different from a messenger so uh, we've got a 63 and a 63 on this table is an archivist that works really well I think because archivists um, they keep records and letters and stuff like that so um, sabotage the efforts of an archivist um, let's let's call that uh, let's call that steal the uh, steal the information or some scrolls or something like that so we know there's an archivist in there now if it's a temple and it's been a good temple why are they allowed to steal something from the archivist there maybe the uh, uh, maybe the archivist is from a rival temple to the ones that are coming in, or maybe the archivist has taken over. It's usually easiest to have the taken over kind of thing. So he's taken over the temple, and he's using it for some kind of archivy thing. Um, so what, where do you get a sinister archivist? That's kind of a weird concept. Um, you can always go to you know demons and devils to to get an evil anything that you want to have in there. An evil archivist is um, well, I mean he could be part of an association, and he's just the the archivist for the association, or maybe he's recording whatever it is um, that's in the process of going bad here. But then it seems like that's in the army instead of some adventurers to go uh, take care of. It. Or maybe nobody knows that the mission is the archivist. Um, at all right at this point um, so this could be like an association of um, I don't know evil people 
and they've taken over and they've left their archivist in control and um, hmm. I mean archivist is really really good for getting clues and stuff across but as a as a sinister sort of uh, villain but you get to, you know that's that's kind of a tough one you don't really have librarians as the enemies in very many stories at all evil archivist he's got a, he's got a fez looks kind of like a bomb. Maybe it's not a person. Maybe the archivist is like some sort of um, spirit thing or something like that. And the archivist... Uh, actually, that's going to be a little bit tough for first level. That might be too hard. So, okay, so, well, maybe... All right, so the place has been taken over by our association uh, of evil people of some kind, and their attacks done... But the, um, the archivist is still there, and he is uh, collecting papers. Oh, here's good. Okay, so he's collecting papers, and he's sent some of them, sent most of them already. And so that way, the players can get various little clues in terms of the stuff that's still there. Um... And then we've got another one where maybe they can go find um, some of the other papers, if that's the way that we want to go with this. Or um, maybe he's still looking for hidden ones? That's good, because then the characters can sort of fan out in the Mega Dungeon and look for uh, for hidden documents, and then we can set up all kinds of different trails that they can follow when they sort of you know Easter egg the... The, the next piece of information so that that works okay so anyway um it's been a fairly long video on this one and i think it gives a pretty good idea of um one way of just basically brainstorming the beginning of a of a mega dungeon here i didn't really talk too much about the campaign um except for the fact that you know we've got the the city of of uh jordaba and that it's going to be the old city is is very nearby so that you've got your adventure location um We've got a sort of uh, Moorish Moroccan feel in, in Jordaba, but, um, you know, since it's going to be the central city of the campaign, I think we can assume that pretty much any culture is going to show up in there. So um, we'll just we'll build out the city as we go. We'll probably start them out. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll put them in an apartment building. And if it's uh, if it's like Moorish Moroccan, that means that it's going to be like a courtyard here. And so maybe if they're in a courtyard um, and then there's a square here, a plaza um, where they can buy whatever they need to. One of the things about a city is that you you don't want to have it. It's easy to have it both over and under uh, detailed. I mean, if you're doing, you you don't want to have every single um, place mapped out with descriptions or anything like that. It's, you, it's just like with most campaigns. It's it best to start out small uh, with a city. And so my little square here is is going to be you know right close to conveniently uh, the city gate. Um, and then this, again, since I'm using miniatures, if I want to, I could throw together a little, uh, a little urban square here. Um, but the thing is that in this square, it's very easy to say, um, you know, everything's here that you need. And so then if they, you know, get to other stuff, uh, then buying equipment, but we'll be able to say, look, all the equipment that is, that you need is here. And then we'll either have the tavern be, uh, the main building where their courtyard is. I mean, maybe they've got an apartment, you know, back of the tavern or else we'll put our uh, tavern here they won't need an inn because they're going to have rooms here um, and that also is going to give me a set of um, relatives or associations or friends or things that they have already in the city that we can then draw on later uh, in order to give us new adventure hooks um, you know maybe they've got a friend who's you know associated with the thieves guild um, actually the halfling is going to be a thief so that the thieves guild connection is not going to be hard to do so anyway, you know, this this is going to be our sort of basic information that we give them, and then we're going to develop this area, and uh, whatever mission that it is that uh, I dream up having to do with uh, uh, this archivist, the evil archivist, um, uh, it's going to be... Uh, you know this basic setup of the thing of the uh, these little sub areas. The reason why it's important to have sub areas, by the way, is because it gives the characters a sense of accomplishment when they realize that they have explored and contained a particular 
area that they can say, yes, we've got we've got this area nailed down. We've found what's in this area. Let's move on to the next area. And it also creates uh, tactical uh, bottlenecks here that can be important if you are running from monsters or ambushing monsters or trying to get them channeled through a particular area. You know that the only real uh, connection here between this group of rooms that you've got that the, the characters have on their map and this group of rooms the connection is going to be that one big gate so if they can block that off then the monster is going to have to go around whatever system it is that gets them around there um, and so you can have them making intelligent uh, tactical decisions by having these bottlenecks here and there in the dungeon so that's the reason why it is that this is set up that way a lot of credit um, for this uh, goes to Gabor Lux, who is the guy who um, first visualized uh, Mega Dungeon in this sort of schematic way um, of the of the blocked off rooms. Now he was doing it mainly as a flowchart to see uh, how linear the dungeon is, and um, he was using it to evaluate various different dungeon maps of the past to see how linear they were or how non-linear they were. Um, and in the course of the same discussion that led him to doing that, it was on a thread, I think either at uh, Knights and Knaves or at Dragon's Foot, um, when we were talking about it, I thought up this idea of how there are what I called pinch points um, here and there. And so I use this in a slightly different way, I think, than, than Gabor uses it. I, I use it, um, you know, to construct the kind of tactical thing. Um, and I think he does his to check the linearity of things, which are, are very related concepts. But I think you just, you know, two, two people happen to have different approaches to, to what they focus on. So... Okay, so we're back again. I've been noodling over our campaign and Mega Dungeon for about 10 minutes, um, wandering outside with the dog, and realized instantly that we have one problem, which is that our uh, villain that we're uh, focusing this mission on um, is at least presumably a kind of a human dude, although he's working for an association of evil people. Um, but the monsters that I wanted to use are things like oozes and slimes, uh, slugs, uh, a big worm, stuff that I can very easily make out of clay. So um, we are, we're going to need to add a little bit to uh, some of our concept here. I'm going to, uh, I was going to switch the camera over, but it turns out I can only do that right at the beginning. So, um, uh, so you won't have the benefit of seeing the sheet of paper that I'm working on, but that's okay because I'm, you know, mostly just doodling and writing down notes anyway. So the, um, what we've got, we've got our archivist, and so let's say um, for our evil association, they're probably going to be, if they've got an archivist, they're probably going to be wizards of some kind, so we'll just say that it's a an evil association of wizards, and then wizards always have minions of one type or another. So if we need a minion, you know, who's like a, you know, super giant ogre or something like that, then we'll just say that they found themselves a super giant ogre, or, uh, whatever it is. Wizards are pretty flexible as uh, as enemies, just like uh, just like clerics and cultists are. So we've got our um, our evil association here, and whatever it is that they do, um, it's going to have to involve producing or controlling um, weird, um, easy-to-make-out-of-clay animals. And so let's say that um, there are going to be a lot of those things in the dungeon probably because um, I'll, I'll reuse the, the little clay things that I make. So let's say that what they do, in, uh, rather than creating them, um, we'll say that they, they control... Um, some sort of ability to control icky beasts. Um, so I mean, they could they could maybe kind of be druids or subterranean druids. I don't I don't really think that works out terribly well with uh, icky beasts. So um, we'll say that they've got you know just some sort of spells or things like that that they use to to control icky beasts. And that way, uh, we can have all of my clay animals and the things like that um, that I want to have as as the opposition. Um, be there and be controlled by our archivists, but we still, uh, archivist singular, but we'll still have the ability to have him 
uh, you know, having some collections of papers that he's dredged up, um, possibly, you know, a, a quest to go and find some if they find out that there's a treasure map that he's already sent out to somebody, maybe in the city. That Actually, that would be a really good connection to go back to a city uh, adventure if they, if they do that, would be to find out that there is a, a treasure map uh, located in the city, they get a hold of that treasure map, which tells them where the secret doors and things are that they can use to get um, into a particular area in the Mega Dungeon, where they'll have a map maybe how to get it. So then they'll have a little bit of a partial map. Um, they'll have a way to go through and get the treasure, and then we'll put something nasty behind the door for the treasure. So that that gives us a city adventure. It gives us both the uh, the motivation for the city adventure and it tells us where we're going to get to from there. So that's that's pretty good. So num number two may be a city adventure of some kind. Um, so we've got our, let's see, we've got our archivist. He controls icky beasts. Um, part of the rewards are going to be information that are involved in this one. Um, okay, so that's pretty good. I'm going to noodle for another five minutes and get back on again. Okay, so so took about a five minute break there and uh, went outside with Milo and a couple of things uh, occurred to me outside. They were not useful for the stuff I was trying to think about, but a lot of times that's where creativity comes from. And um, so I got myself stuck again on that question of what can I make out of clay. And I did have two more ideas. Uh, one of them is a spiky thing, sort of like a sea urchin. You know, just roll up the clay and then poke some holes in it and make it look spiky. Um, and then the other thing uh, would be some sort of uh, large beetle, because once again, you roll the clay up, smush one side of it, and then cut you know, a couple of little uh, grooves through it to make it patterned like a beetle. So a, large, a big beetle is another possibility that we're going to have in terms of the monsters. And um, then the question that we were trying to think of before was, I'm not sure exactly, but we've got our evil association of wizards. And so um, thinking about how to actually get the thing started, um, I had assumed at the beginning, just because the first of, uh, of my players said that uh, he wanted to play a cleric, and so I was assuming it was going to be a clerical uh, kind of mission, but uh, given how close the area is, it seems like they'd be sending somebody a little bit more important if suddenly uh, one of their temples went offline, and so what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to have that character be part of um, a, a monastery or little church or chapel or something like that um, that only has three other um, people in it. And so that way those three people can be useful patrons um, for the character and it also goes ahead and explains you know, why it is they didn't have anybody else to go and look into this. And so that's why the cleric's going to go ahead and do that along with the other adventurers and uh, even though they know that it might be dangerous it'll it'll still make sense um, to have the thing go that way so we're gonna have them uh, going to the monastery um, now I'm writing down uh, another schematic here um, where I've got um, monastery three other is what I've got on the notes just the three other people um, and then the the mission is going to be find out what happened and so they're going to go there, and we've done our schematic of the uh, of the thing. So basically, find out what happens. That's also why they've got kind of a map. I mean, they're going to know to turn uh, turn right as soon as they get in there. Um, so they're supposed to be finding out what happened, and then when they get there, there's going to be icky monsters, and that's going to be unexpected. Um, and then when they get through the icky monsters, they're going to get to the archivist. Um, or it might be some sign that the archivist was there. And then if that's the case, then um, he may have left some sort of rendezvous or that would lead directly to the treasure map. Um, not sure. This is, a, this is a question of timing things across adventures. We're planning on doing um, two pretty short two-hour sessions on this. Um, so if they go in and they just find icky monsters, um, maybe they find the archivist, maybe they find a minion of the archivist, maybe they find an icky monster that's in charge of the other ones, that's a possibility. So maybe um, boss icky monster. Um, maybe, and then it would be intelligent enough maybe for it, him to have left a uh, a note 
for it, some sort of uh, instructions. Oh no. Um, I think what we could probably do, let's, let's, uh, let's can the idea of the Basiki monster and we'll just say that they're going to go ahead and meet the archivist and he's going to be low enough level for, uh, for them to take him out. And then in the treasure we're going to have the, uh, the link to the city adventure and that's a pretty short series of events. That's something that's more in line with like Pathfinder or 5th edition uh, more than original D&D &D because they're going to get through this pretty quickly. Um, maybe the archivist is just, maybe he's downstairs. Okay, so let's do, okay, let's go back to the Bossicky monster, right? We're going to have a Bossicky monster up in the temple itself. Boss Icky Monster, and then uh, they go down the stairs to get to the archivist, and then that just will that will put in a few more monsters and treasures along the way uh, to make this thing work out more for a session, um, and then when they get to the archivist, archivist. Once again, what I'm what I'm doing is just sort of a flow chart. I mean, this is, I'll hold this up and let you see. This is the sort of thing that I'm, you know, doing. I've got the uh, Icky Monsters uh, archivist, um, and then the treasure link that I was talking about. Except that we're gonna we, what we decided to do is move back here over, uh, re regenerate the idea of the boss Icky Monster. Uh, go downstairs to the archivist. Then we get the archivist, and then we're gonna draw another arrow from the archivist back up to where we had written before. Uh, treasure link to city adventure and then we're going to draw another arrow um, and that one is going to go off to city adventure and that'll be something that we plan next time also oh I found out that Zach is going to be out of town on Tuesday so um, the result of that is actually that I'm going to have a whole additional week to work on this and so that works out pretty well um, but I think basically we've got the uh, uh, the arc if you will assuming that they follow the uh, the hooks and things that are left for him. Um, we have enough of a series of events and places that will let me put together a map and populate that area and then I'll have a place for them to go. Uh, and then after the first adventure, you know, I'll probably build out more of an area around that uh, where they may get into if they go exploring. But I'm pretty sure that if they have a city, if, if they have a treasure map that's, that, that requires them to go to the city, find the treasure map and then come back in, Players will, will chase a treasure map every single time, so uh, I'm, I'm really not too worried about that particular thing. That's going to happen. Nobody, uh, nobody leaves a treasure map for later, especially if you give some sort of you know, indication that somebody else might have the same map if you need to really speed things along. So that's it, and whatever kind of D&D that it is you play, enjoy the, en <laughs> enjoy the hell out of it, but also imagine the hell out of it.